Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for joining me as I talk to you guys about M3 and Prometheus and then how the two of these open source solutions can work together to create a metric monitoring solution at a global scale. So a little bit about myself before we get started. My name is Gibbs Cullen. I am currently a developer advocate at Chronosphere, where we uh, provide a hosted metric monitoring, monitoring solution built on top of M3. Uh, before Chronosphere, I was a product manager at Amazon and AWS for a few years. And then I've also included my GitHub and Twitter handles here in case you want to connect. So just gonna go over the agenda for today's talk. So. We're going to start out talking about monitoring with Prometheus and some of the challenges it has when uh, reaching a certain scale. Um, from there, we're going to talk about monitoring with Prometheus and M3, followed by a quick demo on how to get started with M3, and then there'll be plenty of time at the end for Q&A. All right, so monitoring with Prometheus. So just to give a quick overview of Prometheus, uh, Prometheus is a single binary metric solution. It comes with a tag-based metric ingestion format and query language called PromQL. It is a scraped-based um, metric ingestion solution. So it is pool-based into a push-based. Um, it comes with an efficient metric storage solution. So it's very, uh, very efficient at storing metrics within itself. Um, it also comes, to be, be, comes with the ability to visualize and graph metrics. Many users do, however, use Grafana for this, but Prometheus does have its own out-of-the-box solution as well. And finally, um, you can create alert. Uh, you can create alerts using Prometheus Alert Manager and metric rollup rules, so you can aggregate sets of metrics using Prometheus as well. So as you can see, Prometheus has really um, risen in popularity over the past few years, and it's kind of taken over the title from Graphite as being the uh, de facto or go-to open source metrics monitoring solution. And this is mostly due to a lot of these advantages that we'll discuss here. So first one being that it's very easy to get started. So there's basically just one single binary that's used for ingestion, storage, and query. And then there's another binary um, that's used for alerting as well. So very simple out of the box setup. It is also the CNCF recommended monitoring tool, which means that most of the software projects within the CNCF ecosystem also expose metrics in the Prometheus format. Um, so this makes it really the de facto tool for getting started. It also has a wide range of discovery mechanisms. So it's easy to use on any platform you're running including Kubernetes. Uh, this also makes it easy to integrate and start discovering particular metric client endpoints to uh, scrape your metrics from. And then finally, it has a wide ecosystem of exporters, which are basically just custom integrations with particular software projects. Um, so most, most major software projects, especially open source ones, have these existing integrations. So this really just means that there's um, a great kind of community around these in integrations when, when you are wanting to implement Prometheus. So getting started with Prometheus, as I mentioned, it's very easy to get started and this is a pretty standard setup here. So um, in this diagram, we have our services exposing metrics via their Prometheus endpoints. From there, we have a Prometheus instance um, set up to discover these endpoints and um, to start scraping and adjusting the metrics from the from these endpoints into the Prometheus instance. Um, from there, you can choose to run an instance of Grafana and point it to the Prometheus instance to visualize your metrics. And you can also do the same for alerting with Alert Manager. Um, so basically, just also pointing pointing your Alert Manager to your Prometheus instance uh, in order to get alerts on your data. All right. So now we're going to get into some of the pain points with Prometheus. Uh, these pain points arise as you start to scale out your Prometheus instances, as well as when you start caring more about reliability. So from a reliability perspective, um, kind of by default, all of your data will kind of go into a single Prometheus instance, as you can see here. So if it does go down, um, you not only lose all active real-time monitoring of your services, 
but you also lose access to all of your historical data um, of, that ver of that particular service. So this is really a significant point of failure with the out of the box setup of Prometheus. So the recommended solution um, to get around this is to have uh, two or multiple instances of Prometheus and having them both scrape the same client endpoint um, so that if one does go down, one Prometheus instance does go down, you will still have a copy of your metrics. Um, and then when it comes to alerting, since the alert manager is also a single binary, you would need to run two, um, two, of it, two instances as well, and then they would trigger alerts for their respective Prometheus instances. Um, so when it comes to viewing data from a dashboard with this setup, that's when it gets a little bit trickier. So um, typically in this, in this setup, you would uh, put a load balancer between your two Prometheus instances and point the Grafana instance to the load balancer. So from there, all read requests would get balanced between the two Prometheus instances. So, you know, if one does go down, you're still able to fulfill these requests. Um, and this generally works well for reliability in the sense that you get one copy, at least one copy of your data. However, the problem is that if you um, are doing rolling restarts of your Prometheus instances for any reason, whether it be maintenance or for upgrade purposes, um, then you'll start coming across a gap in your data as the instance um, is down or you know kind of restarting. And you can see that here in this in this diagram. Um, so in this example, let's say we did a rolling restart of both of our Prometheus instances. You can see that each instance is missing metrics from when that instance was down. So neither instance has a full image of the CPU usage um, over the, the you know over this given time period. Um, so from a Grafana standpoint, if you have a load balancer in front of it, you will really only see one of these instances or one of the two copies of your data. Here, so if you do refre refresh your graphs, um, you'll get either one gap or the other in your graph, and this can really lead to um, inconsistent results. And unfortunately, there's uh, no really out of the box solution at the moment with Prometheus to merge the two sets of data. Um, the second set of kind of pain, or you know, the second major pain point that we will uh, be discussing is around scaling up your Prometheus instances. So common use case here is um, if you are monitoring certain services with a single Prometheus instance, and let's say all of a sudden one of your services starts producing a lot more metrics, um, then maybe that, that one instance can no longer manage the load and can become overwhelmed. Um, so the, recommend, the kind of the recommended way to get around this is to create a separate Prometheus instance and then have that instance uh, store and scrape metrics from the particular service while having the original instance store and scrape metrics from the other services. So by doing this, you are manually sharding the load across your fleet of Prometheus instances. Um, however, this does get a little bit tricky for a few reasons. So the first is from a dashboarding and an alerting perspective. Um, so you need to tell each dashboard or alert in this scenario, um, which Prometheus instance to point to in order to get the data you're looking for. Um, so originally all of the dashboards were pointed to the kind of this first Prometheus instance, but now that the data set is sharded across the two, um, you not only need to change the data source in Grafana when you are um, kind of wanting to look across the two different instances, but you also um, will like, kind of lose any of the historical data of service A when you do kind of, um, you know, spin up the second instance. Um, and then the same, the same thing happens with alerting as well. Um, so there's another, there's another scenario or instance when a single dashboard or alert needs data from both um, of your Prometheus instances. So kind of summing up the data across your various services here. Um, and in this case, you would need to make sure all of your data goes into a single place. Um, so in order to do this, you will create a third instance through a process called federation. Um, and this will allow you to see, you know, see your data across or view your data across both instances. Um, 
by federating, uh, by creating this uh, federated node, you get a subset of data from your original instances. And then this allows you to query the, kind of query this federated or third instance, um, you know, with that subset of data from the various services. The problem with this, however, is that you still only have a subset of data stored in your federated instance. So if you do need more data than what's in that node, you need to also query uh, and point your alert uh, manager to the prospective instances um, where that data is being stored. So as you can imagine, the management of this and knowing which instance has which data and which ones have an overlap of the data can get very hard to manage um, at scale. So uh, as you can see here, scaling, scaling this up leads to many more federated nodes, which can leave you with a very complicated Prometheus structure. Um, so similar as the kind of previous slide, uh, if you wanted to look across, um, across your instances, or in this case, across regions or zones, you would need to federate the data in another Prometheus instance and combine that across both zones or regions. However, you still need to maintain awareness um, and understanding of which Prometheus instance contains the data that you're looking for. All right, and so the third pain point that we're gonna discuss is around efficiency. So um, Prometheus is not the most efficient when storing long-term data. And this is mostly because there's no built-in downsampling capability. So for example, if you're storing data for six months at a scrape interval of 30 seconds, it ends up taking up about um, 8,000 kilobytes. But if you, were to, if you were able to downsample the same data set at a one hour resolution for the six month period, it would only use about uh, 68 kilobytes. And then that's just for one instance. So you, you can see like, you know, if you were to scale up to 100 instances of Prometheus, this discrepancy becomes much larger. So as you store more and more longer term data, um, downsampling becomes a very valuable asset for efficiency. Um, and just, you know, one thing to note is that as you start to look at metrics for that six month period, um, even in dashboards, there's no really great way of viewing your data at a 30 second granularity because there aren't enough pixels on the screen. So it's much more common to store your data at a higher granularity anyways. Um, but regardless, Prometheus does not have a great out-of-the-box um, way of doing this. So the way to get around it is um, to kind of federate your data so that you would have a second Prometheus instance, as you see here. Uh, and this instance would read the raw 30-second data and then downsample and store it in a separate instance at a higher resolution. Um, however, by doing this, the downsampled data needs a new metric name. So when you do query the data, you need um, not only need two separate queries to look across both resolutions, but you also have to um, kind of switch between dashboards within Grafana to look across the two uh, views of data. All right, so now we're just gonna kind of recap um, the major pain points that we've discussed regarding uh, scaling up Prometheus. So from a reliability perspective, uh, Prometheus is not really designed to handle these availability zone or region failures, especially uh, with a high level of consistency. Um, in terms of scalability, um, you know, as we discussed, the management overhead of sharding the various data sources can become very painful over time. Um, and in addition, the management of uh, federation and configuration becomes difficult at scale as well. And then finally, in terms of efficiency, um, whoops, um, while the platform is really great at, you know, storing short-term metrics, without the downsampling capability, there's no great solution for storing longer-term data. Um, not to worry, though, you know, Prometheus is very aware of these pain points, um, and they, you know, as they and they intentionally built Prometheus to be a very easy out-of-the-box solution. Um, so, and rather than kind of going in and creating you know, um, solutions for these pain points themselves, they introduced this concept called remote storage that basically has remote write and remote read APIs that it exposes 
And then these APIs can be implemented by other technologies such as M3, Thanos, and Cortex, which can then be used to solve for these pain points at scale. Um, so for the rest of the talk, we're gonna dive into M3 in particular, and then um, how, how M3 and Prometheus can work together to solve for these particular pain points that we've discussed. Okay, so monitoring with Prometheus and M3. So just gonna give a quick overview of M3. So what is M3? Um, it is a open source metrics engine. It's comprised of three main components. Um, one is a custom built time series database called M3DB, which is used to efficiently store all metrics data. Uh, then there is a ingest and downsampling tier. Um, and finally, we do have a query tier that is used to provide optimized queries and fetches for all of the data. Uh, M3 was built in open source from day one, having its first uh, kind of check-in in GitHub in around April 2016. It was also originally built to solve the metrics and monitoring use cases at Uber, um, which it successfully did. And since then, it has helped many other companies such as Walmart with their various metrics and monitoring solutions and use cases. Um, and it is continuing to be maintained by Uber as well as Chronosphere. And as I mentioned, it is designed to be Prometheus remote storage compatible. So some of the key features of M3 as they tie back to the main pain points with Prometheus that we discussed, um, from a reliability perspective, you know, M3 does keep consistent copies of all its data. Uh, it ha does have a you know, default replication factor of three. It's also designed to tolerate single node availability zone and region failures out of the box. Um, it's also designed to be highly scalable. So each tier is horizontally scalable and it has already been proven to store billions of metrics time series data at a time. In addition, uh, it was built with a very simple operation in mind. And this was, uh, this was to kind of help reduce the need for a complicated uh, management overhead um, as you scale up. And then finally, in terms of efficiency, um, it does have a built-in downsampling capability, and then all data is optimized with a special compression algorithm that was designed specifically for metrics and time series data. So going into the um, architecture overview of M3, we have our three tiers here that we mentioned. Um, you know, the first being the ingest downsampling tier called the M3 coordinator. From there, we have a distributed time series database called M3DB. And then finally, there's the query tier called M3 query, which is used to fetch all data. On the right side of things, um, we have our, you know, Prometheus instance pointing to M3 via the Prometheus remote write endpoint. So the coordinator from there will then implement this Prometheus endpoint. And then on the, on the read side of things, we have Grafana, um, an instance of Grafana set up, and it's pointed directly to the M3 query tier, as you can see, which has a built-in Prometheus or built-in PromQL read endpoint and can execute, um, execute any read requests by fetching data from the M3DB uh, tier. So diving into the M3 coordinator and the write path, um, as you can see, we have a Prometheus instance here writing to the coordinator using Prometheus remote write. Um, every data point that goes into the coordinator will get replicated three times, and then these uh, data points will then get written to three different places across the M3DB nodes. Um, when writing these metrics to the M3DB nodes, the coordinator does use quorum write, which means that at least two of three copies of data uh, have to successfully write over in order to, for it to be called a success. So if this doesn't happen, then the coordinator will re retry uh, until it does become a success. The coordinator is also in charge of downsampling. Um, so uh, what this means is the coordinator will generate downsampled data inside itself. So for example, when a raw data point comes in, it will be in charge of not only writing that raw data point to M3DB, but it will also be in charge of downsampling that data, um, data data point. And then uh, from there, it'll write that downsampled data 
to the various M3DB nodes using quorum write. So zooming in uh, a little bit inside um, one, of, one of the M3DB nodes, there's a couple concepts here that we're going to discuss. Um, the first is a namespace, which is most similar to a table in most other databases. Uh, it is generally recommended that you store um, data with the same resolution and retention periods within a single namespace, and then that namespace will then be spread across all um, M3DB nodes within a cluster. So within a namespace, all data is sharded and replicated. So as I mentioned, there are going to be three replicas of each data point. Uh, in terms of the sharding, it does occur on the metric ID, and these metrics are then randomly sharded based on their metric IDs, which are essentially just um, a combination of a metric name and a metric tag key value. So inside a shard, there are two components of time series data. Uh, the first is, a, um, is an in-memory metric index. This is um, going to be an inverted metric index, index that uses a tri-like structure to fulfill certain queries, and it can also read regex and glob patterns. Um, in addition, all metric time series data is going to be stored against the metric IDs themselves, and also they're also going to be stored based on time um, and blocks that go back over time. So, for example, um, in this diagram, we have the metrics being stored at two hour blocks, and these um, two hour blocks are being and these data and the data points are being compressed into these two hour blocks um, by our compressor compression algorithm, um, so that you know. The, the two hour blocks are stacked up next to each other. And then finally, on the query and read side of things, um, we see that the query tier here can implement both PromQL and Graphite or StatsD metrics. Um, in this particular diagram, we have a um, instance of Grafana pointing to our M3 query tier, just as you would um, with the Prometheus instance. From there, the M3 query tier will fetch all of the data being requested using quorum reads. So this ensures that at least two of three copies are being fetched successfully um, so that you can get a consistent read. From there, it will apply uh, any functions on top of the data before then returning it back to Grafana. So one of the good things about the M3 query tier is that it is a stateless tier. So, um, so you can put a load balancer in front of M3 M3 query tier and have any of the instances um, that you have set up um, be able to fetch the data for you. So for example, when pointing your Grafana um, instance to the M3 query tier, you just have to point it to one of the single read endpoints, and then you don't have to worry about which data source you're connected to within Grafana. And then one final thing to note uh, about the M3 query tier is that it is designed to be 100% compatible with PromQL. Um, so scaling up M3, um, as you can see, we still have a similar setup here where all metrics are being scraped by a single Prometheus instance, which is then which will then forward along um, the metrics to M3 via Prometheus remote write. So, you know, scaling, scaling up um, your various tiers here, it's just a matter of, um, you know, putting a load balancer in front of them and then adding additional instances. However, um, the way of doing this is varies across the different tiers. So for the coordinator in the query tier, because they are stateless, it's much more simple and you can just basically add additional instances. However, for the M3DB tier, um, it is designed to be aware of when you are adding or removing instances um, to, you know, to the node or to the tier. So it is a stateful or it is a stateful tier. So it, when you are wanting to scale up this tier, you do need to make sure that any sort of configuration changes are being made. All right, so now we're going to look into how M3 works across multiple zones. Um, so in this example, we spread out our M3 cluster across three zones. Um, as you can see, we have the coordinator, query, and M3DB tiers here uh, spread across these three zones. 
However, um, you will notice that for the M3DB tiers, we have kept um, a single replica of each um, of each tier within a particular zone. And this is designed um, intentionally so that in case you do have one of your zones go down, um, you still have two copies of your data. Um, also in this example, you have the coordinators here um, writing to all three replicas of M3DB, as well as the um, query instances here were, are also gonna be reading from all replicas across the zones. Um, in looking on the right side of things, you can put a load balancer in between your Prometheus instance and the coordinator, and then have the Prometheus remote write um, go to any of the coordinators. Uh, and then as an alternative, if you didn't want this set up, you could also run your coordinator as a sidecar next to your Prometheus instance. And then looking over to the read side of things, um, you would also put a load balancer here in front of all of your M3 query instances, and then you could point your Grafana instance to that single endpoint, which would then evenly distribute your query requests across the zones. Um, so basically, if you do, uh, if you did lose an entire availab availability zone, uh, the cluster will still be up and running, and you'll still have two copies of your data intact, so that you can um, kind of maintain that quorum read and quorum write logic that we discussed earlier. And in terms of the load balancers here, um, if a zone did go down, they would simply just reroute the data to the um, zones that were still up and running, and then they would do this until the so when that went down, um, you know, comes back online and recovers. So um, in general, it's kind of to help with the management of this multi-zone setup. Um, really the M3DB tier is the hardest part in terms of scaling up and, man and management. Um, so because of this, and that's, and that's because it is a stateful tier, as I mentioned. So um, in order to kind of help help with this, um, we do have a Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes operator in open source. So if you do want to run M3 on Kubernetes, all you have to do is tell it the number of instances you want in the cluster. And then from there, the operator will take care of scaling everything up and down for you. And now we're gonna look um, kind of across two regions. So, um, in this example, it's gonna, you're gonna have a similar setup as the previous screen, um, having you know, the various tiers here spread across three zones. Obviously you don't see the zones in this example because we have zoomed out a bit. Um, but in terms of this setup, the recommendation for having multiple regions um, is to have all the data that's being stored and produced in a particular, in a particular region stay in that region. However, um, if you do want to kind of look across regions, um, we do, you know, the recommended setup is to have your M3 query tiers here connected so that they can talk to each other across regions. And then that's how you can make any sort of fetch requests across your multiple regions. So for example, if you did want data across um, your various regions here within a single Grafana dashboard, um, how this would work is a query request would come in to your local query tier, which will then fan the query out to all other query tiers um, in, in the other regions you have set up. From there, the uh, query tiers will fetch data from their local M3DB cluster and then send, send the um, results back to the original qu query tier for that request. From there, that, you know, that original query tier will then combine the data across all regions and then perform any functions on that data locally inside that particular query node um, and they it'll do this before sending back um, the requested data to the dashboard or to your instance of Grafana. But you know the main point to get across here with this setup is that when you do have multiple regions it is not recommended to replicate data across your multiple regions. Instead you want to store the data within its respective region and then simply connect the query engine so that they can fetch data across across your regions as needed. Okay, so now we're gonna get into a quick demo of getting started with M3 and M3DB. And then just a couple of things to note before I switch over my screen to the demo. Um, 
you know, we did talk about Prometheus Remote Write, and we will kind of show that in the demo. I also already have three instances up and running um, just for the purposes of time and for the demo. We have two Prometheus instances up and running, and then we do have one instance of M3DB. And in addition, um, you'll, you, you want to make sure to check out our the documentation we have around M3, um, as there are other ways of deploying M3 if you are interested in going about those as well. Okay, so now we have the demo up and up and running here on my screen. Um, so it is a pre-recorded demo, so I'll just talk through the different stages here. Uh, so you can see I've already kind of um, kind of CD'd into, into the repo where I have my various config files that we'll be using to kind of get um, the, the different instances up and running. Um, so from here, you can see all I did was just a single cube cuddle command. And this from here, you know, created the cluster for me. So super simple, just one cube cuddle command to get the cluster up and running. And then here is the, uh, you know, kind of the, the configuration file for that cluster. So you can see we have the replication factor of three. And now I'm just going to show you um, kind of, I, the operator is already up and running in the back end, but I'm just going to like run this command here to show that to you. So as you can see here, um, pod status says we do have it up and running. Then now I'm going to do a quick uh, kubectl command to get pods to show you the various instances that I already have up and running that I mentioned. So, um, so here are the two Prometheus instances I mentioned, A and B. Those are already up and running for me. Um, and then, and then also just one thing to note here is I do already have um, an instance of Grafana up and running as well. All right, so now we're going to kind of go to Grafana. So we're going to port forward to our Grafana instance um, with port 3000. Cool, so now we're in Grafana, in the Grafana UI. Um, we're going to go through the dashboard to go to the dashboard portion. Um, so now, yeah, so I've gone ahead and selected the Prometheus A data source, um, which is set up to scrape from the Prometheus B instance. So running the up command here, you can see that we only are getting data for that one instance of, you know, Prometheus B. Hold on, I'm zooming in a little bit now at the 15 minute interval. Um, so doing the same thing, switching over to the Prometheus B instance. Um, also with the up command, you can see that we're only seeing data here for the Prometheus A uh, instance. So now if we were to go in and add the remote write configuration to our Prometheus config map, config, config map um, configuration and kind of apply that. Now, switching over to our M3DB instance and data source, you can see we have, um, you can see both, um, both Prometheus instances here in the same view. So rather than having to switch between the data sources, you can just see everything in one, in one snapshot. And then this is with the up command. I think I'm going to show one more command here. I'm just getting a different, different perspective. Um, we're going to scrape dur duration seconds metric. Um, so again, you know, you can see here the two, the two, uh, the two instances or metrics across both instances are being shown together here in a single dashboard. Um, so that is that concludes the demo. All right. Well, so now that we concluded the demo, that kind of uh, wraps everything up for my presentation. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, and before we get to q and I did want to kind of go over a few different resources here for M3. So, you know, um, if you're interested in kind of getting involved with our community, we have a very active Slack channel, so make sure to sign up there. Um, you know, if you have any additional questions on some of the topics or components I touched on today, 
Um, you know, you can go to our documentation to dig more into that as well. And then on top of that, we do host uh, monthly office hours, which you can sign up for with this link. And then we also do have a community meetup group where we try to host um, meetups every month. So yeah, thanks again. Uh, and now we will open it up to Q&A.